not sick with anything contagious. And so he's staying at home because of that. And so that's, if you see me up here right now instead of Pastor Jason, that's why. Um, he just didn't want to take a chance on harming anyone in any way. So that's why he's not here this morning. That's why the teens as a whole are not here because we had a really good teen service planned where they were going to give their testimonies and talk about what the Lord had done for them at camp. Perhaps we'll do that next week. Just have to see what the week holds. But perhaps we'll do that next week. Hopefully so. But this morning we're going to have church, as we should, and we're going to worship the Lord together, as we should, and we'll have a message, and we'll do our best to worship the Lord in spirit and truth and honor and glorify the Lord, which is what we all came here to do. No matter what else happens, we know that's why we all came here this morning. So let's stand together, and uh, Pastor Sam's going to come and read our scripture for the day. Scripture reading will be from Psalm 34. I'll read verse 1. We'll have you read verse 2 and close together on verse 6. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall, shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were light, lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. Altogether on verse 6, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it said this poor man cried, and the Lord saved him out of all of his troubles. We thank you for... We poor sinners, having cried to you and said, save me. And we know that you've done it and we trust you. And we're looking forward to our heavenly home one day. And in the meantime, we're here to worship you in spirit and in truth. So we lift up those who are not able to be here today and ask you to touch them and strengthen them and help us have a good time in the Lord today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's sing together. Sing with us now. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift. Sorry about that. You came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. 
name. All right, let's sing the last verse. Oh, precious fountain that saves from sin, I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood of light. Glory to His name. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Let me let you know what's going on this week again. Hopefully, we'll have the teen te testimony service next week. We certainly hope so. And meanwhile, what's going on this week is if you attend our Wednesday Bible study, um, this is our monthly luncheon day, so be sure and bring a side or a dessert. We'll be having fried chicken dinner after the Bible study. So if you come on, sun, on Wednesday morning, be sure and come and expect a great time studying God's Word and then fellowshipping together. Tonight we will have regular service, so be sure and be here. Choir practice at 515, service at 6. Let's see, next Sunday evening we'll have the Lord's Supper, our monthly Lord's Supper on Sunday evening of the 18th and we'll have another family fun night on Wednesday night July the 21st we had a great time the last time had 60 something people here had pizza and ice cream and games and a short service this time we're going to have hamburgers and hot dogs um, if you'd like to help cook the hamburgers and hot dogs contact the pastor We've got a week and a half, contact him, because if we have 60, 70 plus people here, we need some help cooking, cooking hamburgers and hot dogs. So if you'll do that, he would appreciate it, so be sure and contact him. And then the last Sunday of the month, we have guest singers, Dr. Steve Pettit, president of Bob Jones University, and his bluegrass group, BJU Grass, which is both him and several students from the college, will be our special guests. They'll be with us all day. Um, Dr. Pettit will be singing, obviously, with his group and then preaching in the morning service. And then Sunday night, we'll have a full concert from them. Um, we've invited a few churches in the area that we hope will be able to come and, and on Sunday night for this concert. And we'll have a great time together. So plan on that. That's the last Sunday of the month. We just have all kinds of different things around here. And that's a great thing because different things appeal to different people. And you may say bluegrass is my thing. I love it. You may say bluegrass is not my thing. But you come and enjoy. I know there's going to be people in the church family that enjoy and have a good time together. And we'll look forward to a great time. So that's what's going on the rest of the month. We're not having children's church this morning. So children, you need to stay in here. Um, Mike and Lori Denny were supposed to do it this morning, and their daughter was one of them that was on the van, so they stayed home with her. So we're not having children's church this morning. That's an explanation of that for those of you that might be wondering. So stay in here. Let's all stand together, and let's all sing together again. We're singing about the name of the Lord this morning, so let's sing about His name. Your name. That rise from earth to touch your heart and glorify your name. Your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your name is a shelter like no other. Your name, let the nation sing it louder, cause nothing has the power to strength to live for you 
and glorify your name. Your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your name is a shelter like no other. Your name, let the nation sing it louder, cause nothing has the power to save. But your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your name is a shelter like no other. Your name, let the nation sing it louder, cause nothing has the power to save. But your name, thank you so much. Be seated, please. Pastor Sam. God, we praise and magnify your name, for it's in your name that we're able to be here, that we're able to have any form of worship that is pleasing to you, that makes sense for believers to gather, to come, and to proclaim your name. We are so uh, blessed to be able to worship you in, in the freedom that we are able to. We pray for uh, those around the world, other Christians who today are meeting in fear. They're meeting uh, in fear of what the authorities might do, of what the government might do. We, we pray that you would grant them boldness to still worship Jesus and that they would be a light to a dark world. We thank you so much for the, the Bible that we have this morning, that we carry with us, that we're able to read from and have such access to this morning. I pray that you would be with our time of preaching. May it grant encouragement to us. May it help us to remember what's truly important within our Christian life. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. Take your Bibles this morning. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. We'll be in the opening part of Hebrews chapter 12. We'll do a little a bit of introduction on this passage and get to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 uh, talks a great deal about endurance. When we think about endurance, when we think about patience and the ability to endure, we all might have a different definition of what that looks like. Endurance, for my dad, looks like going out and running 26.2 miles, the distance of a marathon. For some of us, endurance is just enduring Florida during the summertime and, and with, with, withstanding that and being able to make it one more day. We all have different definitions of what that might look like, of enduring, of staying the course, of being patient with what is in front of us. As we look at our text, we see the definition of, of biblical endurance, to endure, to withstand, and to carry on through trials and through difficulties. Uh, personally, in my life, uh, I think of endurance. I think of uh, a lot of uh, times in my life where I've needed endurance. <laughs> I've needed just a little bit of strength, a little bit of energy to continue on physically with what God had called me to and with trying to find that last amount of energy to continue on. Uh, throughout high school and th through a little bit of college, um, endurance was always something that I really thrived to do. Uh, I could, if you're talking about running sprints or, or running a mile, sign me up to run the mile. I don't want the sprints. I don't want the short distance. And while I was in college, I, I remember one particular soccer practice that was absolutely grueling. Uh, we had been scrimmaging. We had been running a lot. We had uh, finished with a, with a longer run. And then after that, it was like, oh, by the way, <laughs> now we're doing sprints. So line up and do sprints. It took all of my energy, all of my endurance to just finish, to take what little amount I had left and keep going on and keep enduring throughout the time. Spiritually speaking, we look at endurance, we think of the strength to carry on, and we, we might be falling in different categories with that this morning. Maybe you're coming and you're, you're feeling refreshed, you're feeling the energy, the endurance to continue on. Maybe you've been struggling. 
There's no endurance. There's no way spiritually that you can say, hey, I, I'm in a good place to be able to continue on for my Savior. I'm in a good place to continue what God has in front of me and to keep running the Christian race. Running the Christian race, we, we understand the background of, of the book of Hebrews. This was a book written to encourage believers during times of trial. They were under persecution for their faith. They're, they're shaken. They're, they're doubting the hope of their salvation. Can they continue on? Can they keep running faithfully? Can they continue in the Christian race of faith? Or is it something where they're so discouraged, they've faced so much opposition that they just can't seem to continue on in the Christian life? The writer of Hebrews writes, he writes strong promises and hope to these believers, the hope that is found in Jesus. Jesus is superior. He is above all things. And the book of Hebrews reminds us of this. God has spoken to us in many different ways, in many different forms, but he has spoken to us through Jesus, the all-powerful creator. Jesus came as the perfect sacrifice as we see, God graciously accepted these sacrifices to atone for sins. But finally, as the New Testament reminds us, the perfect sacrifice for sins would come. Jesus, the spotless Lamb of God, would be that sacrifice for us, satisfying the righteous demands of God. You look at the book of Hebrews and you're reminded that Jesus is better. He's better than the prophets. He's better than the priestly system. He's better then all of these things put together, Jesus is better. We see through Hebrews chapter 12 how richly blessed we are as believers to have this word of God, to look forward to the promises of God, and to see the full story of who Jesus is and how he helps us, he encourages us to run our race of faith. Hebrews chapter 12 in your scriptures as I read, you follow along starting in verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. This morning we should understand that all believers can effectively run the Christian race of faith as we look to Christ and remove distractions from this world. Keeping our eyes on Christ will give us the grace and the strength that we need to run faithfully. The first thing we see in this text is believers are commanded to run with endurance and to remove distractions in this race of faith. Verse number one gives us a direct look back to Hebrews chapter 11. It reminds us that there were a cloud of witnesses of believers that were in this chapter. They weren't perfect. They weren't the perfect form of Christians of never making a mistake, but by God's grace, they lived out their faith. They trusted in the promises of God, and they finished their race of faith. As we look at this race, we look at the difficulty of, of living in faith, of living as a strong believer for Christ. It takes endurance. It takes a great amount of effort for us to be able to run faithfully. But praise God, we can look back in the scriptures and find so many examples of faithful Christians who said it was worth it to run faithfully. That yes, they had distractions, they had other things around them where they could have fallen out of the race. They could have said, it's, it's not worth it. It's really not a, of a benefit for me to run this race, to run faithfully. But they endured, they ran faithfully, and the prize ultimately being that they are among the witnesses. They are those who are in Christ and have a home in heaven. All of their races of faith, they look different in Hebrews chapter 11. Different temptations, different distractions, different ways that they had to point their focus and attention to Jesus and run their race. The demonstration of how these individuals look to Christ shows their, their purpose of how they wanted to leave a spiritual example. The pillar commentary says this about Hebrews 11. 
These champions of old time occupy the place of spectators, but they are far more than spectators. They are spectators who interpret to us the meaning of our struggle and who bear witness to the certainty of our success if we strive lawfully. This idea of running this, this race, of, of being faithful to what God has called us to, it's hard for us to endure. It's hard for us to keep going on for the name of Jesus Christ, but they endured. They ran their race of faith, and this gives us a great amount of encouragement to say, hey, look, they ran. They endured. They continue on, and we can continue in our race of faith as well. We are commanded from this text to lay aside every weight. This is a, a challenge and a warning to the believer the phrase literally means that we are supposed to put off or to remove these weights. A runner in a race that wants to run their best, they're very careful with the apparel that they're wearing. The type of shorts that they have, the shirt that they have, the shoes they have, everything they want, they want it to be a certain way. Chances are you're not going to see somebody with work boots, with a full weight vest, and with all these extra, a backpack and all these extra weights, and say, hey, I'm going to run the best race that I've ever run before with all of this on me. Why? They don't want anything slowing them down. They don't want anything that could cause them to run slower, to be weighed down in a race physically. Doesn't make sense. You can't run your best if you're weighed down by all these different things. And the writer of Hebrews reminds us if we're weighed down by distractions, by the things of this world, we'll, we'll still be running, but we won't run as well as we would hope to. We won't run as faithfully as we would like to for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, if we're so distracted by everything else but following Jesus in this race of faith. The application for believers is to not add spiritual weights or distraction as we run this Christian race. A weight is not necessarily a sin, but it is an obstacle that will keep us from effectively running for Christ and keeping our eyes on Christ. So what's our motivation as we run? I trust it's not just that we have this satisfaction in who we are, but that we run our race well by God's grace. These weights can creep into our lives, and it may look like we are spiritually running, but we're adding all of these weights and distractions onto our life to where we're not running as we should. Whether that's a sport, whether that's a hobby, whether that's something that's taking up so much of our time, and we're not even sure of why we're struggling, we're not sure of why we're discouraged and not as faithful as we were as believers, but the writer of Hebrews is saying, be very careful with these weights because we can add them from so many different directions and they slow us down and they hurt our progress in living faithfully for Jesus Christ. If we're not careful, we can run into the mistake of allowing the things of this world to control us. That's what Satan ultimately wants to do. He wants to add in these weights and distractions slowly and sh but surely. He wants to pull our attention and our affection away from Christ and put it on things that won't matter for eternity. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, we see an, an example of somebody that gave in to the things of this world, that ultimately was so encumbered, so weighed down, that he lived just like the world. 2 Timothy 4 verse 10 says, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Here was a co-laborer in the gospel. He was faithful to what God had called him to. He was doing ministry, running his race well. He kept adding weights. The weights of the distraction of this world. And slowly but surely, those weights were enough to say he's forsaken Paul in the gospel ministry. He's no longer faithfully serving in the ministry. He's forsaken the ministry because he loved this present world. If we want to run this race the best way that we can, we must guard ourselves against the distractions of this world. They will pull us down. They will ruin our effectiveness for Christ in running this race as we should. We are also commanded to put off the sin which so easily besets us, a major hindrance as we run this race. We can remember times when, when sins came into our lives when they slowed us down from running the Christian race. 
Perhaps even a a single sin that we have struggled with keeps coming up to us and it reminds us again that we're not running as faithfully and effectively as we should. The context of this passage reminds us that we are not putting off a specific sin, but we're removing sin from our life so that we can run with endurance, we can run with patience. As we know from scripture, the Christian life is not a sprint. It's far from it. It's a marathon pace. It's a marathon distance, slowly but surely living faithfully unto God. The Christian race is is full of trials, it's full of testings that help us to become more like Jesus. The book of Hebrews tells us to take this stand to fight against sin. It warns us that there are the of the danger of sin and how sin can lead to falling away from things of the faith. This is a challenge to all believers, both personally and for those that we know. Maybe there's a time in your life where you can really look at how sin distracted you, how it weighed you down, how it pulled you away from this race of faith, and you really needed to set your focus again and to run and to be faithful to what God has called you to. But perhaps there's somebody you know, a friend or a family member that They were in this race, they were running faithfully as as far as you could tell, but the sin and the weight of this world has pulled them apart and has made them so that they're not running at all. I see all kinds of different things running in in different races uh, around the area here, and you see all all kinds of different people. You see people that pace themselves very evenly throughout a race, and they're, they're running through the entire time. Sometimes you see those people who are a little bit too eager And they just take off in a sprint and it's like, whoa, (laughs) we got a long way to go. That was a bad idea for them to go out as fast and as hard as they could. We still have a lot of work to do. Eventually those people that go out, they go out so fast, they go out so strong in their race. A lot of times you'll see them walking a little bit, trying to catch their breath. They're They're trying the best they can to get back to running in the race. And in the Christian life, I think there are, that's a danger for some Christians of going out, of running so strong, of being so uh, into the things of God and running so faithfully at the start, but eventually they're not running anymore. They're walking, they're struggling, they're struggling to take one step in front of the other to be able to keep their attention and their focus on Jesus. There's a danger and a warning here to keep our eyes on Christ. A lot of times our spiritual journey, and I, I'm thankful for this reminder um, that I found through studying this passage, but a lot of times we like to think of our course, spiritually speaking, the way that we're running on is a nice smooth surface and it's a perfect day to run and it's, it's perfect for us and there's no obstacles in the way. But if we're honest with ourselves, with what we all face with each of our personal races, it can look difficult. It can look like there's more twists and turns than we're having to run, uh, running up hills. It can look like a very difficult day, spiritually speaking, for us to be able to run. That's all the more reason for us to fix our eyes on Jesus and to center on him as we are running our race of faith. The text reminds us, it says, let us run. Here the author of Hebrews is bringing himself into this picture and challenging others to run the race. We can't focus our attention on what other people are doing in this race of faith. Where there are other believers who are running their race of faith, they are running faithfully as unto the Lord. God's calling for each of us this morning is for each of us to run our individual race. I can't run your Christian race of faith for you. You can't run your Christian race of faith for me. But we can focus on the race and the journey, spiritually speaking, that God has given to us and by God's grace run our individual race to God's glory. The Greek word for, for race is agon, which uh, comes apart to the, to the Greek word agony. This points to the hardships of the Christian race, but also the spiritual endurance that we need to be able to run this race. Praise God that he knows our course that is in front of us. He knows every turn, He knows every difficulty. He knows every place that could potentially trip us up, every place where it's just running straight uphill and where it's difficult for us, where we must endure and give extra strength and effort. God knows our course. He knows what is in front of us and what we are running to. 
Runners in this race are commanded and encouraged to keep running. No matter where we are going, no matter the setbacks and the hardships, we are commanded to stay committed to God for our lifetime as we run this race of faith. We need this idea of patience or this endurance and constancy to stay committed in this Christian race of faith that we wouldn't be shaken even during the greatest of trials. We understand the joy of the Christian race, the joy of those who go before us, and we pray that we would increase in our faith, that we would run, and that our faith would increase and our doubt would go away. Because doubt can be something that creeps into our life that, again, shifts our perspective and thinks, well, why should I even run? Why should I even be in this race of faith? Someone said this on the idea of doubting in this passage. Doubting and living in faith contradict each other. Unbelief entangles the Christian's feet so that he cannot run. It wraps itself around us so that we trip and stumble every time we try to move for the Lord if we try to ask at all. We need faith. We need to pray for our faith to increase because Satan would like nothing more than for us to doubt our race of faith, to doubt our purpose as Christians that we can't keep going on, that we don't have the endurance, that we don't have what we need to be able to run faithfully by God's grace. We pray for strength and grace to be able to overcome Satan and to keep our eyes on Jesus. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 through 8 says this, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Paul was convinced that as he labored for the Lord, as he ran his race of faith, that he kept his faith till the end. He ran faithfully. He kept his eyes on Jesus. He ministered. He gave out the gospel. He's not seen here saying, well, I have all these regrets of things I wish I could have done differently. I wish I would have ran better. I wish I would have encouraged others to run their race of faith better. Paul says here he's ready to meet the Lord. He's fought the, the, the good fight. He has finished his course with joy. And by God's grace, as we, whatever that is, when we finish our race of faith, that we would be able to say we ran well, we ran faithfully, and that when others see our life, they wouldn't just see us, but they would say, you know what? Jesus was the reason that they ran. Jesus was the reason that they could endure, that they could have the faith that they needed to leave an example for others to be able to run this race of faith. We see the command to run the race with endurance. Now let's look at the author and finisher of our faith. Secondly, this morning, we are compelled to look to Jesus Christ as the source of our strength. He is the reason for our Christian race. The first command in verse 2 is to look unto Jesus. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus. Just like in a physical race, there's many things. If you're looking around, if you're uh, trying to see everything that's going on, there's all kinds of different distractions, all kinds of things that can pull you away physically from the race that you're running, from what's right in front of you to be able to run the best way that you can. Spiritually speaking, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus to remain fixed on Christ. Don't focus on the, the different circumstances, the things that could pull us away from this race that could cause us to slow down, but look to Jesus. He is our primary focus for spiritual success and endurance in this race. We are to model our race by the standard of Jesus Christ and look to his example as we run this race. There will be a great amount of spiritual distractions and discouragement that will take place if we take our eyes off Christ. As we run faithfully and we keep our eyes on Christ, we will run by God's grace and we will leave a faithful example. But the warning here, I believe, that we see from Scripture is for those believers who are trying to run and they don't have their eyes on Jesus. They have their eyes on everything else but Jesus. They're looking around, they're wondering why they're struggling, they're wondering why they're discouraged, but their eyes are not on their Savior and they're not running well. Peter has this test with Jesus as he is in the midst of the storm. 
Peter goes and he recognizes Christ and, and walks out to Christ. And Matthew 14 gives us this, the end of this story. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Peter sees Jesus. He's encouraged by this. He does have at least the ability to be able to go out, uh, be on the water, and walk towards Jesus. And everything's going well. He's walking out towards Jesus. He trusts in that. He steps out by faith. He looks to Jesus. He's okay. Nothing's happening to him. Nothing is going wrong. Verse says, the text says, but when he saw the winds, he was afraid. He began to sink. Peter looked around. He looked around at his circumstances. He saw everything that was around him. Immediately, he starts to be afraid. He thinks, I don't know if Jesus can really save me from this. These winds and, and the seas are, are so strong. Can Jesus really save me from this? He's afraid. He starts to sink. And Jesus, of course, rescues Peter and questions. He says, oh, you have little faith. Why, why, would, why would you doubt? Why would you doubt Jesus? It's very easy for us to say, well, Peter, keep your eyes on Jesus. That's the answer. That's the solution. If you would have just kept your eyes on Jesus, you would have been safe. You wouldn't have been in fear. You wouldn't have gone underneath the water. You wouldn't have had Jesus to go and reach out his arm and be able to save you and rescue you from that. How many times in our Christian race of faith are we pulling our eyes off Jesus out of fear, out of doubt of, can Jesus really help me at this point in the race? Can Jesus really give me the strength that I need? With all the circumstances, with everything that we see around us, with how discouraged we are right now, we look around and we too can become afraid. And we need Jesus to pull us back and say, that's not where you should look. As hard as it is for us to not look at our circumstances, we must keep our faith and our eyes on Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of our faith. He allows us to enter into a relationship with God. God no longer sees the, the true believer in the, the realm of their sin and their wickedness, but he sees the Christian in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, perfect righteousness of Jesus. The phrase finisher of our faith could be described as the perfecter of our faith or the one who brings this to a successful conclusion. The idea of Jesus as the perfecter of our faith, it's reminded, we're reminded of this in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. It says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Jesus has started that work of faith in our life. If we are his children, if we are saved and we have trusted in him, the promise is given in scripture. He will continue that work till we see Jesus in heaven. He won't fail on his side of things. It's not that we can't trust him to be able to continue that work. We can trust in the complete work of Jesus if we are saved. Jesus allows all believers to start in a walk of faith with him. All the, the believers that were mentioned in Hebrews 11, they, every believer had those times as, as they began their journey of faith and their personal relationship with Jesus. The book of Hebrews reminds us why Jesus is the author of our salvation. Hebrews 2.10 says, For it became him for whom all things and by whom all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. In Hebrews 6, verse 20, it says, Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The perfect work of Jesus Christ gives hope for our eternal security. We run this race of faith because of the sacrifice of Jesus. We continue because Jesus was born into this world as a man, he was able to be here to uh, grow on this, on this world and this earth. He was able to face temptations. The book of Hebrews reminds us that he was able to 
withstand all those temptations, that we look at our high priest who was faced with these temptations while he was on earth, yet without sin. Never once did he give in to the sins of this world. Jesus was faithful to that end. We will finish this race because Jesus is guarding our soul and we can trust in his promises and the faithfulness and goodness of God. Jesus was committed to doing the will of the Father while on earth. Jesus talks to the Father as he faces the cross, as he faces the suffering that awaits him. Ultimately, he says, Lord, if it's possible, allow this to to not happen. But ultimately, he asks that the Father's will would be done. Jesus trusts God in spite of all the suffering that will take place. Jesus would endure the worst and the cruelest of forms of death on behalf of believers. The crucifixion was humiliating. It was excruciating during Christ's time, and it was filled with a tremendous amount of pain and suffering. This was meant as a way to be able to, again, the the death of a common person, of a criminal that was found in society. Jesus, it says that he endured the cross. He didn't pass over the cross. He didn't pass over any of the amount of suffering. Enduring the wrath of God, he was able to remain on the cross, to die on the cross for our sins. Jesus proclaimed that the work on the cross was finished. Nothing more needed to be added to the cross to be able to fully save sinners. Jesus was able to endure the cross, and now as a result of that, we have direct access to God because of the work of Christ. This joy was found in Christ, not necessarily for the way that it meant for Jesus to have this joy faced in front of him for the suffering, for the difficulty, for the agony that was meant on the cross But understanding that Jesus was accomplishing the Father's will, understanding what it meant for Jesus to give his very life on the cross is what kept Jesus on the cross for us, for sinners to be able to pay the penalty for sins. This concept is seen in John 17, verse 4 and 5, where it says, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Jesus left us an example that even as he knew uh, the tremendous amount of pain and agony and suffering that that was awaiting him on the cross, he submitted to the will of the Father that put him on the cross to die for sins. As we run this Christian race of faith, are we able to obey the will of God for our lives? committing our life to Jesus, committing our rights to, our life to say we will run this race of faith by God's grace. We'll remove all the distractions. We'll set our eyes on Jesus Christ. We look forward to the joys of heaven, of, of glorifying God through this. But again, if we want to run well, it will come with submitting to the will of God. It will come with moments where maybe our way of doing things looks quite different than what God says his will is for our life. And God will have to change our direction. He will change our focus so that we can run well and so that we can give glory and honor to his name. The last phrase of verse 2 says that Jesus sat down. This reminds the believer that the work of atonement and redemption is complete. Jesus fully satisfied the wrath of God and endured the death on the cross. Jesus Christ accomplished all that is needed to offer spiritual life and salvation for those who trust in him. Jesus will provide strength and grace for us to continue on in our race. We find a number of reasons for putting our faith and and focus in Christ alone throughout these verses. When we see Christ for who he truly is, our response should be that we submit to Jesus and the path that he has set before us. We're not sure exactly what that path looks like. We're not sure exactly what God has before us, but we know it's a path that God wants us on and that he will give us the grace to continue to run. I want to share this quote on this passage. When believers who are running their race fix their eyes on Jesus and rely on him for support and help, 
they know that he is the perfecter of faith who is seated at God's right hand, having endured the cross and shame for them. Verse 3 in Hebrews chapter 12 gives believers another reminder to stay in this race and consider the example of Christ. When we get tired, when we are burdened in this Christian race of faith, we consider the example of Jesus. We live this race of faith not in our own power at all, but it's through the power that God provides for us in the name of Jesus that we are able to run, that we are able to see our lives changed into the image of Christ. The believers in this book, they were going through difficult times, through a difficult journey. They found encouragement, hope, and help in knowing that Jesus endured and that they could look to him for strength. I want to close by just giving some points of application through this text. What do we learn from this passage? We learn about the promises of God. We learn that we can trust in God as we know more about his character. As we are running this race of faith, we learn, yes, we can depend on God. We can trust in him no matter what happens, no matter what our race of faith looks like, we trust and depend on God at all times. Number two, we put off any distraction that will keep us from focusing on Christ. We need to be fully committed to Jesus. That means we remove distractions, we remove sins. We look at our lives honestly and say, you know, if there's something in my life that's causing a great deal of my time of my energy why are we doing those things why is it that that's a part of our life why is it that that's what we have in our life is that right to have in there is it not right for us to have that in there are we running our race of faith the best way that we can number three we look to christ as our example as we run the race of faith he is the one who will renew our strength as isaiah chapter 40 verse uh, chapter 40 says He renews our strength. He restores us so that we can run faithfully unto him. Number four, we remember our identity in Christ and what Christ has accomplished on our behalf. We remember the blessings, the privileges that we have in Christ. We praise God for all of them. In summary and conclusion, we have this race that will have hard times, that will have trials and tests but we can keep our eyes and our focus on Jesus. We can all run our race of faith. We can all run it well and faithfully unto God. We can encourage others to run as well, that they could keep their eyes on Jesus. Through Hebrews chapter 11, it wasn't just super Christians that were able to run this race of faith. We're encouraged by their example, but we're also able to say, we can run our race of faith as well. Maybe you're here this morning And your step of faith is trusting in Jesus for salvation. You're not in the race. You haven't come to that place where you've seen your sin and you understand your sin. And you need to repent and turn of that sin and place your faith in God to be able to save you and forgive you of all of your sins. That would be a tremendous opportunity for you today to make that decision and to turn to Christ. Let's close in prayer. God, I thank you for this text of scripture. I thank you for giving it to us this morning. God, you know our journey of faith this morning. You know the difficulties that we've had to endure, the twists, the turns, uh, the the agonizing, the pain that we are facing. Um, You know all of it. And I thank you that you are able to know that and you're able to help with that. God, I pray that you would just meet our needs. You'd give us the strength that we need to be able to endure. As we have our time of invitation, as we uh, hear the piano playing, if you would like to step out, if you would like to know more about salvation and trusting in Jesus, we ask you to come forward to be able to make that decision. If you'd like to come forward and to just pray for encouragement, please take time to do that now as well.
God, we thank you so much for uh, your word that was given to us. We pray that we would be uh, refreshed and encouraged by it. In your name I pray. Amen. Uh, well, at this time, we'll have the men come forward. We'll uh, be able to do our offering time. They hesitated for a little bit. They're making me a little nervous, but it's okay. Gary, could you say a prayer for our offering, please? Let's close out our service by standing and singing together. We've sung songs about the name of the Lord this morning. Let's finish that up. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Sing with us. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The glories of my God and King. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you. You're dismissed. Come back tonight.